Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Eric Leeper. Eric is a professor of economics at the University of Virginia, an advisor to the Swedish and German central banks, and a former Fed economist. Eric has written widely on the links between monetary policy and fiscal policy, and joins us today to discuss these links and the implication for the price level. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a real delight, Eric, to have you on the podcast. I've been following your work for some time. You've written extensively on the links between monetary and fiscal policy. You've written extensively on the fiscal theory of the price level. And these past few years seem very relevant to your work. As you know, we've seen the national debt go up by about $5 trillion. It now sets at about 100% of debt to GDP. Primary deficits are forecasted as far as the eye can see. And inflation is rip-roaring hot. The last reading came in at 7.9%. So your work on this is very important and very relevant right now. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. But before we do that, maybe tell us a little bit about your past. How did you get into economics and ultimately into this research area that looks at the link between monetary policy and fiscal policy? Well, I was an undergraduate at George Mason University. And the professor who really got me interested in economics was Howard Block, who was a microeconomist. And partly it was because he was both provocative and rigorous. And he provoked me to need to learn more economics so I didn't have to buy into his political views. (laughs) And I think I also appreciated the logical rigor of his teaching. Now, how I got into macro, it's embarrassingly naive. We were learning ISLM, not from Howard, but from someone else. And I remember shifting those curves and just feeling incredibly powerful. And I thought, wow, I could really do something good for the world by learning macro. And ISLM is inherently about monetary and fiscal policy, and I think that's what triggered my my original interest. But then it really got going. I went to University of Minnesota, and I had teachers like Tom Sargent and Neil Wallace and Chris Sims. I also had Ed Prescott, but he wasn't so much oriented toward the policy stuff. And That stuff also was just incredibly provocative with all of these neutrality results and things that made me feel sort of impotent, (laughs) exactly the opposite of ISLM. (laughs) So again, I was provoked into being forced to think about ways that I could do things in an equally rigorous way, but not be impotent. And so that was really the genesis So you had Chris Sims, who has also written on the fiscal theory of the price level. So did you get that inspiration from him, or was it a collaborative effort? Well, he had an old paper that I'm sure nobody has read, because it was in the appendix to an annex of a doorstop book published by Brookings Institution, edited by Ralph Bryant, for whom I was a research assistant before I went to grad school. And that really got me thinking about the stuff in a kind of serious way. So it's not that we collaborated, except to the extent that we had lots of conversations. But when I wrote my dissertation, which really was sort of a more elaborate version of what ultimately got published, I kind of just did that in isolation. It was a weird experience. And then I delivered my finished dissertation to my committee. Okay, very interesting. Well, let's jump into your work and discuss you know, what is some of the key ideas in this literature. And I want to do kind of baby steps first, Eric. So let's start with fiscal dominance. A lot of talk about fiscal dominance now, given that context I laid out earlier, the large budget deficits, expected primary deficits going forward. And Sargent and Wallace in 1981 had a paper, Some Unpleasant Monetarist Arithmetic, where they laid out some of the key ideas. So what is fiscal dominance and why does it matter to us today? 
I think of fiscal dominance as a special case of monetary and fiscal interactions where the government issues nominal liabilities. That's a difference between the fiscal theory and unpleasant arithmetic. In unpleasant arithmetic, government debt is real and therefore has to be backed fully by real taxation. And what unpleasant arithmetic exploits is that that real taxation comes from seniorage revenue rather than from taxes, say. Once you make that debt nominal, then on the margin, debt doesn't have to be fully backed by taxes. And so the idea is, let's say that hypothetically, the government puts out $5 trillion in transfers over a course of a year. It finances those by selling nominal bonds. If those bonds are fully taxed, fully backed by taxes, then individuals, at least to a first approximation, are going to be thinking, well, gee, I got more transfers today, but I'm going to have to pay more taxes tomorrow. And therefore, I'm going to save some of this. Or in the extreme, you save all of it. That would deliver Ricardian equivalents. But suppose that what happens is this spending is regarded as emergency spending, and there's no discussion at all about how it's going to get paid for. Well, then people see these transfers as an increase in their wealth. And like any increase in wealth, they're going to save some of it, spend some of it, which is exactly what we've seen. And as they spend, you are going to generate higher aggregate demand and therefore higher prices. And that would be considered fiscal dominance. The opposite case where it's fully backed by taxes is sort of the standard view of how fiscal policy operates. And that's what's embedded in most of the literature. Okay. So let me provide maybe a dumbed down version of that. So you tell me if it's right or wrong. But you have fiscal dominance on one hand, and then there's another term, monetary dominance. And this will tie into some of your work later. We'll talk about active and passive monetary and fiscal policies. But monetary dominance, is that the case where the central bank you know, targets inflation and does whatever it needs to do to get there? And then fiscal policies in the background supporting those objectives. So fiscal policy is kind of passively working to support monetary dominance, where fiscal dominance is flipped. Fiscal dominance, now the Fed has to support whatever Treasury is doing because, you know, Treasury needs to stay solvent, has to generate revenue somehow and relies upon seniorage revenue. So and that's, I guess, kind of the, the connotation you hear fiscal dominance, you're going to tie the Fed's hands, you're going to force them to do things they don't want to do. And therefore, they will lose control over inflation because some other overriding goal will be more important for Treasury. Is that a reasonable explanation or did I miss some nuance there? Yeah, no, I think I would add one thing. Obviously, monetary and fiscal policy have a great many objectives, but necessary to achieving any of those grander objectives is, first of all, that inflation gets determined somehow. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that debt is stable. If debt gets off on an unstable trajectory and everyone believes that it's just going to grow without bound as a share of the economy, grow fast, too fast, quote unquote then you can't achieve any of the other objectives. So I think that at its most basic level, what policy has to deliver is a unique inflation rate and stable debt. And so monetary dominance is one where inflation is really under the control of the central bank and debt stabilization is the job of the fiscal authority. And fiscal dominance just flips that. But so the point is that What the Fed is required to do under fiscal dominance is ensure that debt doesn't blow up. And one way it can do that is by just pegging the nominal interest rate so that debt service doesn't accumulate too quickly. And that actually is what we've seen the Fed do over a much longer time than I like to think. So we may well be in that kind of a world. Okay. Now, you had some work in 1991, a well-known paper in the Journal of Monetary Economics titled Equilibria Under Active and Passive Monetary and Fiscal Policy. So how is this related and built upon you know, Sargent and Wallace's ideas of fiscal dominance and monetary dominance? Well, I chose the language active and passive 
because I thought that the way I was describing monetary and fiscal behavior was consistent with the way that the economics profession had used that terminology in the past. And I think of an active policy as one that is just blindly pursuing its objective. It doesn't have to pay any attention to what the other authority is doing. And so, for example, if you tell a central bank your primary task is to target inflation, then it's going to do that and it's going to pay no attention to what the fiscal authority is doing. But then the other authority has to be passive. And in the context of this monetary dominance world, passive means that you are stabilizing debt. So the passive authority has to take the behavior of the active authority as given. And what Sargent and Wallace did was they basically assumed you had a constant primary deficit. That makes fiscal policy active in my terminology. And then monetary policy in their setting has to just generate whatever seniorage revenue is required to stabilize debt. So what they wrote is basically a special case of the possibilities that you've set out in your papers. One combination. Yeah. Okay. Right. So one of the things that I like about your work is you really stress this link. Central banks don't operate on the islands magically <laughs> independent of what's happening to the rest of public finance. And you had a 2010 paper at the Jackson Hole Symposium held by the Kansas City Fed in the paper's title, Monetary Science, Fiscal Alchemy. You had a line in there that was really, I think, important and tied to what we're discussing here. And in it, you talk about this, quote, dirty little secret. And here you are talking to central bankers from around the world, probably one of the most prominent central bank meeting gathering. And you mentioned this dirty little secret that exists. And I'm quoting you here, and you say, for monetary policy to successfully control inflation, fiscal policy must behave in a particular circumscribed manner. So central banks don't operate in isolation is what you're saying. <laughs> There's an assumption that there is some kind of fiscal backstop that's in place. So even the most ardent monetarist at least implicitly has to acknowledge, look, if you've got a bankrupt federal government, it's going to put pressure on you. How was that point received by central bankers when you, you made that at the conference in front of them? I'm just curious, were they willing to accept your point? You know, ever since I, I mean, going back much further than that, than when I was in the Fed, I started at the Fed in 1987, and fiscal policy was just taboo. And I get that central bankers should not be speaking publicly about the details of fiscal policy. But we have seen more and more that central bankers are willing to talk about kind of the aggregate features of fiscal policy and whether they are appropriate for what the central bank is trying to achieve. So I think there's been an evolution. If we go back to Volcker, and, and this is where the dirty little secret is really laid bare. We attribute to Volcker the success of disinflation. And what people seem to forget is that after the 1981 tax cut, which was very large, there were then, before the end of the decade, five tax increases. Well, that is exactly the kind of fiscal support that you need for that disinflation to be successful. And another way to think about this is that tight monetary policy has to be followed by tight fiscal policy, if we want to really put it in simple terms. And I think that by and large, in the post-war period in the United States, we have seen exactly that pattern of behavior. Not so much in the 70s, but then we weren't really seeing tight monetary policy in the right. 70s either. Right. And we saw what the consequence was. But now, my concern is that the situation is really very different. When Volcker was doing this, debt as a share of GDP was about 25%. Now it's 100%. If the Fed has to, as Larry Summers is now saying, has to raise interest rates to about 5% to fight off the current inflation, that's going to raise debt service by about a trillion dollars. Now, these days, a trillion doesn't seem like real money, but it's still going to require some sort of a tax increase. Otherwise, debt becomes unstable. And what will happen is bondholders will be getting more interest payments. If they don't anticipate that those interest payments are eventually going to get taxed away, then that becomes a positive wealth effect at precisely the time 
that the Fed is trying to tighten. That positive wealth effect could undermine the Fed's ability to bring inflation down. And that's my worry now, that we may be breaking from that norm of, you know, that deficits beget surpluses. I bring up this question that you've answered very nicely about central bankers, and, and you noted that the evolution has changed. And it's definitely the case we saw Chair Powell talk a lot about fiscal policy during the pandemic, for example. But it, it's interesting, if you go read the FOMC, the Federal Reserve's you know, Committee's statement on longer run goals and monetary policy strategy, this is like their constitution, if we can call it that. But it's every year they reaffirm it or they tweak it. But what it says in there is, quote, the inflation rate over the longer run is primarily determined by monetary policy. So they're taking ownership of it. They're saying this, it's all about us. And I'll mention also a speech by Governor Chris Waller, who himself has written on the fiscal theory of the price level. We'll come back to that later. But last year in March 2021, he had a speech titled Treasury, Federal Reserve, Cooperation, and the Importance of Central Bank Independence. And here's what he said. This is a paragraph I'm just reading from the speech. He goes, quote, because of the large fiscal deficits and rising federal debt, a narrative has emerged that the Federal Reserve will succumb to pressures to keep interest rates low to help service the debt and to maintain asset purchases to help finance the federal government. My goal today is to definitively put that narrative to rest. It is simply wrong. Monetary policy has not and will not be conducted for those purposes. I guess you would say not so fast. (laughs) It depends on the pressures that are coming from the debt burden and its sustainability. Is that right? Well, I can't obviously speak for the Fed and what it will do. I think a central banker has to say those things. That's fair. I don't think it's a problem with central bankers. I think it's a problem with Congress. If Congress is going to give the Fed the job to control inflation, then it's got to do what it needs to do to support that. But there's a deeper issue here, which goes back to how the economics profession has talked about inflation. And, you know, the famous Friedman line about inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. I would agree with that if what you mean by monetary includes government debt. That isn't what he meant. And then you have this whole generation of new Keynesian models that also makes monetary policy seem to be all powerful. And this is all part of the dirty little secret that swept under the rug in those models is fiscal policy doing a lot of heavy lifting. And, you know, if you read Woodford's tome, which is sort of the classic new Keynesian source these days, There will be an occasional footnote because Woodford is a brilliant guy and he knows the economics. In fact, he's even written about the fiscal theory. Right, exactly. He may now be in denial about that. (laughs) But there are little footnotes Mm -hmm. that say, oh, we're assuming this about fiscal policy. Well, that's a lot to assume, Mm -hmm. especially in the current political environment. And so, you know, it's hard to separate these issues from the politics that's going on. But I do think that the economics profession shares some of the blame here. If you believe that really it's only monetary policy that matters for inflation, then the Federal Reserve Act makes perfectly good sense without any adjustment to fiscal behavior. But that isn't how the world works. (laughs) It just isn't. Right. Well, the challenge is not just the profession, I think, but the body politic writ large. I mean, who does Congress go after if inflation is going high like right now? Jay Powell, they'll go after the Fed. The Fed didn't do enough. And yeah, maybe the Fed should have tightened sooner, maybe late last year. But they should actually be also looking at themselves, right? They should be thinking about the decisions they've made. But it's easy to point the finger at the Fed because the Fed has been you know, the center of attention, as you noted, I remember when Alan Greenspan was retiring, I believe there was a Jackson Hole conference that just praised him, you know, all the wonderful things that he did. In retrospect, you know, you dig underneath the system a little bit, you see all those implicit assumptions that you just outlined. Tied to this, so in, in that paper, that 2010 paper, the alchemy part was tied to fiscal policy. And, and in it, you highlight how, you know, monetary policy has kind of kept up with monetary theory, it advances in monetary theory, where fiscal policy, policy and our our use of it is still hasn't kept up, hasn't kept pace with the literature and also, you know, what we know about it. So where does that stand today? What are your thoughts on that issue now? I would say there's been no progress whatsoever. At the conference, the head of the CBO was there and he took great offense. (laughs) 
arguing nice. that we actually do more science than Eric says. But you alluded to the projections of deficits that presumably comes from something like the CBO. And the problem is that the CBO, by law, has to make the assumption of unchanged policy. So the CBO can't do economics. Congress has made sure that the CBO cannot do economics. And so you see these projections of government debt going off to five, 600% of GDP. So I can tell you that the main impact that that Jackson Hole paper had was that instead of doing 50-year projections, the CBO started doing 20-year projections. And then it doesn't reach 500%. <laughs> it's still growing exponentially, but they truncate it. Nice. So to me, that's alchemy. And I don't fault the CBO here either. Right, I think right. it all comes back to Congress wanting to have the Fed as a whipping boy and the CBO as a rationalization for what they want to do. Well, do we set our hopes too high for fiscal policy in, in this sense? We created an independent central bank to be more rigorous, to be technocratic, independent of politics. But fiscal policy is always going to be subject to political change, the whims. It's, we can build in maybe better automatic stabilizers. In theory, we could add some, maybe a constitutional rule. But it just seems like fiscal policy will always be subject to whatever the, you know the latest thinking or fad is. So maybe we shouldn't have high expectations or should we? Well, I think we should, because I think fiscal policy is absolutely central to everything that goes on in the macro economy. Let me back up for a second. The main point that a lot of people make is, hey, fiscal policy has first order distributional consequences, and those should be in the hands of elected officials. I agree with that. But you know what? Monetary policy has distributional consequences too. But somehow we've decided that's okay. We're not going to put that in the hands of elected officials. Alexander Hamilton actually saw the dangers of putting money in the hands of elected officials, which was what was underlying his proposal for the first central bank of the United States. But I think one thing that we could do is think about which components of fiscal policy are really macroeconomic rather than microeconomic. For example, you know, this isn't a formal proposal, but you could think about, okay, we should be running a deficit or a surplus of a certain size. It's left to the elected officials to decide how to get there, but they've got to get there. We shouldn't have debt growing more rapidly than, you know, K percent. How they do that, that's up to them. And so you're putting some limits on what they can do. So it's sort of like having a Fed for fiscal policy. You have some technocrats that come up with those aggregates, and then Congress has to really be subject to those constraints. I don't think that's going to happen, but I think it's not a crazy idea, and I don't think it is undemocratic to think about that. Certainly. But, you know, there are also smaller ways that I think we could make improvements. You know, there's always this argument that, well, you know, elected officials change every two years, and so they can never commit to anything in the future. I think that's oversold. You know, there's a lot of commitment in fiscal policy. You create Social Security in the 30s, and here we still have it. If that's not commitment, I don't know what is. The tax code has a lot of commitment embedded in it. We never see them just do a wholesale change of the tax structure. You know, even the 1986 reform, which was a big deal by historical standards, still retained a lot of features that were there, you know, for decades. So I think that we could do more to communicate, you know, the COVID spending, for example, was it intentional that this was going to be unbacked by taxes? Was anybody thinking about that even? It's interesting that the press secretary at the White House, I think just yesterday or the day before, when talking about the latest request for COVID funding, said, hey, Congress, this is an emergency. You can't apply all your standard rules for budgeting to this proposal. Well, okay, that's a policy. That's a statement that is going to affect individuals' expectations. Do they want to affect them that way? And so I think there's more that we could do 
And I think there's a role here even for the press to play, but we don't see any of that. Right. It would be great to have some way to get you know, the press, everybody out there, myself included, excited about fiscal policy, budget deliberations, as much as we do every FOMC meeting. <laughs> What's the announcement yeah. going to say? What's the press conference going to say? I had a former colleague when I was back in the university. He called it hyper-monitorism. We're so worried about what the Fed's wanting to do, every little minutia detail. What, you know, how did Powell breathe on that last sentence <laughs> as opposed to what are some of the deliberations going on in Congress? Yeah, and in fact, pick up any newspaper that's talking about the Fed, and they they know the minutia. What they don't know is a theory of inflation. And there's a narrative that has grown up around the Fed, and there was a beautiful example of that in the New York Times yesterday. I assigned it to my graduate students and said, critique this. But the narrative is, okay, we've got this nice story about the punch bowl, and it's all Phillips curve driven. Everything is about tight labor markets and on and on and on. And there's no discussion there about what's happening to government liabilities (laughs) and what's happening about the backing of those liabilities. And so I think that the level of discourse is just extraordinarily low with monetary policy as well as fiscal policy. Well, let's move on then to the fiscal theory of the price level. We've been really talking about the ideas that really underlay it and and form its foundation. So walk us through, what is the fiscal theory of the price level? What are the basic ideas behind it? And and how do we apply it to our current setting? Okay. I think the first thing I want to say is I hate the name fiscal theory of the price level. Okay. I think there's only one theory of the price level, and that is that it's determined by the interaction of monetary and fiscal policy. But that was a battle I've lost. So (laughs) I will go ahead and use the term with that caveat. Essentially, I think of the fiscal theory as an outgrowth of Tobin, Wallace, Sargent and Wallace, where what we learned from those people was that the backing of government liabilities is central to determining their value. So if you think about government debt, we really want to think of that as being like any other asset where its value is going to get determined by expected future cash flows. Those cash flows are primary deficits. Those are the goods that the government is going to extract from the private sector to use to pay off those liabilities. And it's not just about government bonds either, especially now that reserves pay interest. They're just another form of government debt. And so the amount of actually unbacked currency in the U.S. economy is tiny. It's literally just bills and coins, and that's just supplied perfectly elastically. So I don't see that's the unbacked stuff as having very much to do with how the price level gets determined. So the fiscal theory basically says that if expected backing real resources for government debt increases, then that debt's going to become worth more That's going to show up as a combination of higher bond prices and a lower price level, because then the real market value of that debt increases. So I think you can boil it down to supply and demand, and where the demand for government bonds depends on the price of bonds and on what the real backing is, which is primary surpluses. You know, there's nothing here that's uniquely the fiscal theory. The statement I just made holds whether you think you live in a monetary dominant world or a fiscal dominant world and so forth. And that's why I say there's really only one theory. But the key difference, I think, here, and this is what fiscal policy has really emphasized, is the fiscal authority has taxing capacity. The central bank, yeah, it can generate seniorage revenue, but if everyone decides they're not going to hold dollars, then it can't get any real resources from the private sector. So long as the government can always raise taxes, it can extract real resources. And therefore, at some fundamental level, what gives government liabilities their value is the taxing capacity of the government. 
So one way to think about the fiscal theory of the price level is an asset pricing equation for government securities, government liabilities. So you have this future stream of primary surpluses, you discount to the present, and that affects the real value today of government securities. So let me walk through a scenario and and help me see the steps from the future to the present. So let's say, whatever reason, we now expect larger primary surpluses for a sustained time. So maybe tax laws are changed, spending is cut. What are the concrete steps that lead to a lower inflation rate we observe in the economy? What has to happen? What do bond traders do? What do households do? Walk me through that. Well, I think the first thing that happens is households get this news that their taxes are going to go up in the future. And because what they want to do is smooth their consumption path, they're going to increase their saving today. So that already cuts aggregate demand. And part of their savings is going to be held in the form of government bonds. So the demand for bonds would increase. And that's kind of the main, the whole story in terms of the economics. It's driven by the desire to smooth consumption. So if you think your after-tax income is going to be lower in the future, then you want to save in anticipation of that. And bonds are one form of saving. Well, there you go. (laughs) Straightforward. (laughs) Pretty simple. rocket science. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. Well, let me throw out the other version of this. I think you alluded to fiscal theory, the price level you said is supply and demand. I mean, let me generalize it. It's a quantity theory, but for all government liabilities, government bonds as well as Federal Reserve liabilities. Is that a reasonable interpretation? Supply of them versus the demand for them? Yeah, but isn't all of economics that? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say all of economics is the quantity theory. <laughs> but all supply and demand. <laughs> quantity theory has a lot of baggage attached to it in my mind. It has very strong implications. People start to think only about M. So I, I'd prefer not to say, yeah, this is a quantity theory applied to debt. Okay. Well, let me frame it this way. The fiscal theory of the price level, one way I like to think about it is you're looking at the expected path of government liabilities in the future which is a quantity, but you're looking at, and that's going to determine the trend path for inflation. What determines trend inflation is, you know, the supply and demand for these government securities over the infinite horizon. How do we like factor into that equation? I guess it'd be in the model somewhere, but supply shock. So let's look at the past few years. We can clearly talk about a fiscal side of the story, but we can arguably talk about some supply shocks as well, right? So The two aren't necessarily exclusive, right? You could still say the trend is being set by government securities in this expected path where we might have some temporary deviations due to supply shocks. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, so what's in that equation that we're dwelling on here, it's not just future surpluses, which of course will be affected by supply shocks, right? I mean, surpluses are very strongly endogenous, but also discount rates. So just loosely, let's think of that as uh, short-term real interest rates. And so anything that drives short-term real interest rates down is going to cause the value of a given stream of surpluses to go up. And so, you know, you can think about a whole host of different shocks that are hitting the economy. In a general equilibrium setting, you would trace through what are their impacts on the path of surpluses? What are their impacts on the path of real interest rates? And then you can compute that present value. Okay. Well, let me move on with the fiscal theory of the price level to some work that I just became familiar with, but apparently others have thought about this a lot in the past. And I became aware of this with Marcus Brunermeyer's work with some co-authors, and he has a paper called The Fiscal Theory of the Price Level with a Bubble Term. And then I, you know, in my subsequent search, I found a paper by Alexander Berenstein and Chris Waller, which we mentioned earlier, 2018, where they have a paper, Liquidity Premiums on Government Debt and the Fiscal Theory of the Price Level. And the basic idea in this argument is that you've got to expand that asset pricing view of government debt. So it's still an asset pricing equation, and depending on how you look at this, I guess. But there's also a demand for government securities related to the liquidity premium or service they provide. Like Waller in his paper, he says, if you just look at discounted present values of you know primary surpluses, it's not going to equal the market value. And the difference is due to the liquidity services treasury securities provide. So we need to account for that 
term. And what Brunemeyer does, and Waller doesn't do this in his paper the same way, but Brunemeyer does, he actually adds a second term on the right-hand side of that equation. So left-hand side, you got you know, nominal government liabilities divided by the price level equal to the discounted present value of primary surpluses plus the discount on present value of these liquidity services that treasuries are expected to provide. So what is your thought on, on that extension of the fiscal theory of the price level? Oh, I think that's really important. And actually, it goes back to Wallace again, because you know his uh, Modigliani Miller theorem says is that if you have identical rates of return and you hold fiscal policy fixed in a certain sense, then things like open market operations may have no effects at all. Now we know that the returns on reserves and on treasuries are different, and a big reason for that is that they serve different purposes in the economy. And there are some legal restrictions. You know, you can't use treasuries for clearing balances and things like that. And you can't use reserves as collateral in the repo market. So I think the question is, how big are those effects quantitatively? And I suspect they're pretty important. There's sort of a revealed preference argument if you look at how active the Fed has been in the treasury market with their standing facilities and repos and reverse repos, that tells you that they think that the stability of the treasury market is absolutely critical. And I think by extension, we need to be thinking about, well, why do people hold these things and and what is their value? I made this argument in a discussion in the Jackson Hole Symposium last year that if you're in an environment where reserves are really plentiful, let's say you've just flooded, hypothetically, you have flooded the economy with reserves. And then the Fed goes out and buys treasuries and pays for them with even more reserves. The question is, is that expansionary or contractionary? Does that disturb the the repo market by making safe assets more scarce? And then what are the consequences of that? So an action that you might think of as being expansionary may not be expansionary if those treasuries are really playing a critical role in the financial system. And I think modeling that is incredibly important. I'd like to try to get a better quantitative handle on that. But that's hard. Yeah, very hard for sure. We had Peter Stella on the show and he with Manmohan Singh, they've had several papers a few years back where they say, look, the Fed is effectively draining the financial system of these incredibly liquid securities because not everyone can trade bank reserves. I mean, reserves are limited to the banking system proper. So, of course, what we are seeing, though, is that the Fed's opening up its balance sheet more and more to non-banks. So money market funds now go into overnight reverse repo facilities. So that's another solution one that I'm not excited about. I don't want the Fed to open its balance sheet to everybody. But the alternative then is we need to think about, you know, the liquidity services provided by treasury securities. So I'm glad to see your your interest in that. And I had also Hanno Lustig on the show. And he, along with Arvind Krishnamurthy, they've done a lot of work on trying to estimate those convenience yields on treasury securities, kind of an empirical approach at this question. He made this point that this is going to be a great research question moving forward, how to estimate the size of that service, how important is it? So it's interesting to see you're excited about it as well. But you know, this is really an old question. If you go back to Brainerd and Tobin, Their whole idea was to think about, you have this this whole range of assets out there, and what we want to try to do is estimate a system of demand functions for those those assets. The problem that they had, because that work just died, and I asked Brainerd, why did it die? Because this seems like it should have been the right way to think about things. And he said, it all came down to, we couldn't identify what the cross elasticities are among these assets. So what I think we need is more theory that is getting into kind of the micro foundations of what these assets are really doing. And then maybe that will deliver some restrictions that will allow us to estimate the things that Brandard and Tobin wanted to estimate. I mean, it's it's the same point with yield curve. You know, theoretical models of the yield curve are terrible. And there are some empirical things, but but there's no theory there. And 
why is a 10-year bond different from a one-year bond? You know, we got to get a handle on that, especially when the Fed is doing a lot of yield curve manipulation through balance sheet operations. And this is the old, it's not that old, but this is what Bernanke said, that, you know, these asset purchases work great in practice, but not in theory. Well, this goes back to the Wallace neutrality critique too, right? In normal times, exactly. it's hard to see what effect. I've made that point on the show multiple times. I had a guest on recently who argued that as well, that outside of panics and crisis, what exactly does large-scale asset purchases accomplish? And there's a signaling channel. I think people, that's a reasonable interpretation. I'm largely of the view that it doesn't make that much difference other than signaling in normal time, normal market operating times. QE doesn't make that big of a difference. However, I had another guest who he gave me pause on that view. Bill Nelson, in fact, he was just on the show. He used to work at the Fed. And he makes this point, and this gets into the plumb. The plumbing is so, going back to your point about micro understanding, the plumbing of the financial system is so important here too. He notes that as the Fed has increased the amount of reserves, what has happened is with this ample reserve system so, or the floor operating system, they want to have a buffer set up so they'll stay on that flat part of the bank reserve demand curve. And so they always want to pack in a little buffer. But what happens is they extend the supply of reserves. That buffer becomes seen as normal. And so structural demand increases. And what happens is you get this cycle where the balance sheet gets larger and larger just to stay stable. So reversing QE, doing QT, shrinking the balance sheet may not be as easy a task as maybe Wallace neutrality <laughs> makes it out to be because of some of the plumbing issues involved. Let's move on from that to back to the application and back to fiscal theory, the price level. And I want to apply this to some countries because this is, you know, critique you will often hear. So let's go through a list of countries. Let's start with, you know, probably the most obvious one, Japan. How do we make sense of Japan with the fiscal theory, the price level? I think there are three important considerations about Japan. First of all, remember that what we're really interested in is the government's net position. So you can't just look at total bonds that have been issued, which is the headline number you always hear for Japan. So you've got to net out their foreign reserves, which are substantial. Then on top of that, a lot of the bonds are held by these kind of quasi-governmental institutions. They're not held by the public. And so how do you count those? And then on top of it, the Bank of Japan has bought a huge amount. If you adjust their data for those three things, the debt GDP ratio in Japan is about 50%. So that's one consideration. The second consideration is Japan has sent very mixed signals. This goes back to the role that expectations play, where they say basically, hey, we're going to stimulate, but don't worry, we're going to contract. A little like what Obama did after the 2009 stimulus package. Well, make up your mind. What are you going to do? You're going to stimulate? You're going to contract. And the Japan has also been under a lot of pressure from the IMF to commit to a path for consumption taxes. So when Abe was there, he postponed the tax increase, but he didn't eliminate it. Well, okay. So what are you really doing here? Does it matter that much to me whether my consumption tax is higher next year or two years from now? In the grand scheme of things, probably not. So it's not obvious that they have been living in a world with active fiscal policy. I think that the expectations in Japan have been pretty anchored on eventually something will happen. And then the third consideration is what we've already alluded to. They've had negative real interest rates for a long time. That's going to make the present value of a given stream of surpluses really high. And that's going to be deflationary. So by the way, this is an interesting point that once you start thinking about monetary and fiscal policy jointly this way, low real interest rates, which are sort of central banks bread and butter for expanding the economy, actually are contractionary in the sense that they raise the value of primary surpluses and make debt more attractive. So effectively, it's it's raising the primary surplus path, which is deflationary in the present. Yeah. Let me take an aside here, Eric, and ask about those low interest rates. So 
I'm a big fan of the safe asset shortage literature that's been out there. A lot of you know, prominent academics have written on this. And maybe it's harder to make that argument now. I mean, we still see 10-year treasury yields just over 2%, despite the $5 trillion added to it. But there's a host of stories you could tell, everything from emerging markets to the demographics of the world, the world's aging, to maybe on the margin, people more risk averse after going through multiple recessions in the past decade. Do you see that as a key part of why rates are low versus... The other interpretation often is the central banks themselves are propping rates low. Is it fundamentals that are pushing rates low around the advanced economies, or is it policy choices by central banks? Well, it's clearly some of both. But I think that there's just no doubt that the secular movement of real interest rates, long-term real interest rates, has been downward. And for reasons that I think are well beyond any central bank's control. And so we've been hitting the lower bound on policy rates pretty quickly. And I think that phenomenon is probably going to persist for decades. You know, the profession's still kind of unclear on exactly what's, as you alluded to, there are lots of stories about it. The one I like the most is the demographics until old farts like me die. <laughs> We're going to have lots of savings. Right, right. <laughs> and I think it also plays into you know, your preferences for what type of assets you hold. It also plays into our growth rates too, right? It's, it's declining population growth rate. You know, For me, that's one of the biggest concerns I have long-term for the US economy is our declining population growth rate. And not only is it the labor supply, but it's where we get ideas from, innovation, you know, kind of endogenous growth theories here. Well, let's move to Europe now and talk about the European Central Bank, because I've seen some papers that say, oh, the ECB disproves the fiscal theory of the price level. It's completely independent from fiscal policy. I don't think that's quite right. Even the ECB, at the end of the day, has fiscal links to it. But what are your thoughts on that application, that setting, as it relates to the FTPL? I think we have to distinguish between the euro area as a whole and individual countries. So for an individual country that's part of EMU, there is no fiscal theory that's applicable because they don't control monetary policy. So to them, it's almost as if they're issuing real debt. They have to take that price level as given. I don't see that that disproves anything. Arguing that it disproves the fiscal theory seems to be a statement that they don't understand the fiscal theory because nobody would claim that there's a fiscal theory operating when you're on a gold standard, and that's what EMU is to some extent. Having said that, as a whole, they could operate just like the United States does in some coordinated fashion to generate unbacked fiscal expansion as the fiscal theory would predict. So I don't really see how that changes things. Let me lay out the case I see for why they are not completely separate from fiscal policy in Europe. And I think this would apply to the gold standard in the US as well. So you can imagine a scenario, let's say where Italy defaults on its debt, has a lot of debt, it could be a a real explosive point in the euro area system. And Germany worried about what that means about the ECB's balance sheet, negative equity position or becoming insolvent might step in and recapitalize the ECB. I know there's there's details, you know, because a lot of the um, countries have their own central banks that are linked to the main central bank. But the point is that from a consolidated perspective, if the ECB's balance sheet takes a hit and it's big enough to create inflation worries, I suspect Germany, who hates inflation, would step in at some level and maybe get support from other countries to do it. But it would definitely, you know, lead this charge. We need to recapitalize the ECB. And that, to me, there would confirm that there's this implicit link, implicit backstop from fiscal policy. Same thing with the gold standard. You know, you can imagine, you know, if the U.S. had problems with the gold standard, at the end of the day, the government might have to step in and, and, you know, buy more gold or intervene in gold markets. Is that a reasonable take on the linkages there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, another way to word this is when Draghi made his famous pronouncement that they'll do whatever it takes, he was making a fiscal statement. He wasn't saying anything monetary. He was saying, hey, we've got the tools. We can buy as much debt as we want. And so if if a country gets in sovereign debt trouble, we can step in. Now, if they end up defaulting on that debt, then there could be balance sheet issues and somebody is going to step in or some collection of countries will step in to recapitalize. 
But I think this recapitalization, there's a nice paper by Marco Del Negro and Chris Sims, where they look at the Fed and they ask, you know, how likely is it that Treasury would have to step in and recapitalize the Fed? And what matters is the present value of seniorage revenue. It's not just current conditions. And they ended up concluding that seems pretty unlikely. Now, the rub is you can't be controlling inflation <laughs> if you're going to be generating seniorage revenue to make sure your balance sheet is in good order. So Germany might step in for that reason, Right. that the alternative is very high inflation. Well, Eric, we are nearing the end of our time. Any final parting thoughts on this discussion? I think I want to go back to the paper by Brunemar and co-authors where they talk about the possibility of there being a bubble in the pricing of government debt. And this connects to what I was saying about Japan, but it's an even more drastic example. If you look at Norway, Norway is not a net borrower by any means. It's a net saver. It has a huge sovereign wealth fund. And when you think about Norway in the context of this equilibrium condition that equates the real value of government liabilities to primary surpluses, Norway should be running primary deficits forever because they have so much wealth. And so you don't necessarily have to attribute you know, the absence of primary surpluses to a bubble term, as uh, the Brunemeyer paper seems to do. It just goes back to, you got to do the accounting right to figure out what the government's net indebtedness position is. Very fascinating. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Eric Leeper. Eric, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. It was a blast. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.